Hello, I'm Shane, and today I'm going to be reading a story from our book, Nature's Hidden Adventures. I hope you enjoy it. The Life of Bombus Riley Bombus Riley was a bumblebee, and a most unusual bumblebee at that. She was born and raised many years ago in an old field mouse nest. It was in a little park that nestled into the bend of a winding river, and what a wonderful little park it was. At its entrance, there were four beautiful old white bean trees. These led into an open expanse of wildflower meadows where daisies and dandelions danced from dawn to dusk. Along this boundary, there was a string of woodland groves. They were full of hawthorn and roan trees that blushed each autumn with thousands of ruby red berries. And right at the edge of the river, with flowers matching every colour of the rainbow, was a most enchanting little marsh. There was the purple of loosedrift, the yellow of flag iris, and the blue of forget-me-nots. Indeed, for a young bumblebee like Bombas, it was like living in paradise. Each morning, the sun would rise above the horizon, drenching the woodlands with light. Then, the most beautiful choir would be heard singing. Blackbirds and bullfinches would lend their voices to the chorus, while great tits and thrushes would join in for the encore. Then, as the morning gave way to midday, the marsh and wildflower meadows would come to life. There were dazzling dragonflies and striking shield bugs. Hungry young frogs hopped through the marsh, while tiny pygmy shoes scuttled through the grass in search of crunchy beetles. Of course, like any beautiful park, there were lots of people there as well. Children would play in the woods and among the wildflowers of the meadow, while their parents relaxed in the sunshine. Most of the people, however, were oblivious to the busy world of the tiny creatures all around them. And there were very few creatures more busy than the bumblebees. All bumblebees, that is, except one. Bumblebees, as you may know, have a reputation for being very busy. And there's a good reason for this. At the beginning of each summer, queen bumblebees lay their eggs, and every young bee that hatches is a girl. Now, usually the daughter of a queen would be considered a princess, but that's not the case for young bumblebees. In fact, these young bees are known as workers. This is because their main role in life is to collect nectar from flowers and return it to the beehive to feed the queen's next clutch of young bees. A queen has several clutches of young bees throughout the summer, and just like her first clutch, each one that hatches is a girl. Bumblebee boys are born later in the summer. So, most of the time, young bumblebees are only ever seen hurrying from one flower to the next, collecting nectar. Bombus Riley, however, rarely appear to be very busy, and for a bumblebee, this was most unusual. You see, Bombus loved nothing more than to talk to the flowers, and the flowers loved Bombus because she was so friendly. Flowers, believe it or not, have lots to say, but very few creatures take the time to listen. So, while all the other bumblebees hurried from one flower to the next, without even saying hello, Bombus always took her time. She would ask each and every one how their day was going. The red clovers loved to chat, while the white clovers always had the latest gossip. But of all the flowers that Bombus visited each day, her favourite was Davin. Davin was the most elegant dandelion, with bright yellow petals and delicate green leaves. And Davin had the most wonderful stories to tell. Of course, Listening to stories all day meant that Bombus wasn't very efficient at collecting nectar. To her sisters, it seemed that Bombus had a far too easy and carefree life. They weren't very impressed, and so they went to the Queen to complain. Queen Hannah was a beautiful bumblebee, with a golden crown on her head and a golden sash around her waist. But what really made her stand out from the crowd was her sandy coloured tail. Now, as well as being beautiful, Queen Hannah was also very wise and very fair. She, 
she would never make a judgment based on secondhand information. So she visited all the flowers herself to find out the truth about Bombus. Every flower loved Bombus, and it pleaded with the queen to let her continue to visit him. However, it was Javan who Queen Hannah was most interested in hearing from. You see, Davin and Queen Hannah were old friends. This is because dandelions are one of the first nectar-rich flowers to bloom each spring, when bumblebee queens emerge from hibernation and are searching for food. And so the fate of Bombus Riley was down to Davin. Davin told Queen Hannah how Bombus helped to brighten up each flower's day, and the queen's heart was filled with pride. After all, Brightening up someone else's day is more important than being busy. So the Queen allowed Bombus to continue to visit all the flowers and spend as much time with them as she pleased. Needless to say, the story of Bombus Riley, who lived a carefree life, spread throughout the countryside. It spread first among the flowers and the trees, then it spread among the insects, mammals, and birds. The story was told and retold along riverbanks and hedgerows, in ditches and in fields. Then one day, it was overheard by some children who were playing hide and seek among the trees. Before long, the saying, the life of Friday, became part of everyday language. However, over the years, the stories behind the saying was forgotten. Today, only a handful of people know who Riley really was. And now, that includes you. The end. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. That's a lovely play on uh, Bombus Riley. Um, did you, would you want to talk about how um, you came upon the names of the characters? Yes, I think when you're writing a story, the name of your character it, it kind of needs to be memorable. It's it's important. Um, I always like alliteration. Um, so we have a story about Mervyn the Mayfly and Sheridan the Shrew and um, Simon the Salmon. But in, in the case of, of Bombus Riley, um, the, the Latin name for bumblebees is actually Bombus. So Bombus is the family name um, and Bombus Riley, it sounds really good. Um, and I always get a, whenever I tell people about uh, the story, I always get a smile when I mention Bombus Riley. I think it's, um, it's certainly a memorable one. It's great. It sounds like a, a name that should have always been in, in mm -hmm. Ireland. Um, I had a quick question. Your illustrations are beautiful as well. What is your process for working um, with illustrators? And how do you, I, I know it was Vincent um, Killary who, who did these in, illustrations. And how do you, how do you work together? How do you give him your vision and and come up with, you know, how you want yeah. your book to look? Because it's obviously so perfect in your own head before you ever put pen to paper. It yes, um, I think it's important when you're when you're writing because I I have a picture in my head of what I think it should look like, um, but the reader and indeed the artist Vincent Calari uh, doesn't. So I have to paint that picture with with words and hope that they they see the same picture as I do. And um, I, was, I was very fortunate meeting Vincent. Um, I, I, I'd written the stories and I, I met with Vincent and usually, Vincent is from just outside Innes. He's an yeah. incredible artist. And usually he paints um, transport. So boats and planes and uh, trains. So nature was a kind of a bit of a departure for him. But in fairness, he did an exceptional job. Um, so I, went down to the studio, sat down with him, told him my vision for what the, the, the artwork should look like. Um, it was important to me that the the artwork reflects the real animal. And I think that was really brought home to me just the other day, because I have a little two-year-old son, William, and uh, he loves being read stories too. And one of his favourites at the moment is a story about two little hedgehogs called Hayes and Ronan, who are looking for someone to save time in it. Um, but after reading that story so many times, we actually saw a real one out in the garden just the other day. And without any prompt, he was able to point it and go, Hedgehog. And I thought, this is, this is what it's about. Um, I, I know my stories, sometimes you have to have a little leeway and poetic license to, uh, to, to tell the story. 
um, to kind of give them emotions and feelings so that kids in particular can can um, understand where they're coming from. Uh, but the artwork should be as close to reality as possible. So the descriptions and their behaviours and habitats should be close to reality so that when you do go out to your garden, and you will, the stories that I tell, they're all based on creatures you should find in your, your garden or your farm or your local park or your schoolyard. So you are going to come across these creatures at some stage and be able to recognise what they are is it's very important. And I often say that my stories are told twice, the first time through the words and the second time through the artwork. And I think for particularly for young people, as adults, we're only really interested in, in the story, but for kids, it's it's more of a, a holistic experience and the, the pictures that link to the words and uh, are, are very important and Vincent did an incredible piece of work with that. Shane, I like the I like the fact that the dandelion takes such a center stage in your story too. It's uh it's much um or you know, it deserves a lot more love than than we give it in our society. Um there's one question from Anonymous. Does Shane think that fiction like this would work for adults sharing stories and learn for learning? Okay. So I think um it works on adults. I do. Actually, I I give a lot of talks, uh, presentations to both schools, but also to adult groups or so community groups. And very often I try to bring in my stories into those presentations. Um, I talk about uh, how I view wildlife and it always gets a great reaction. Um, not everything has to be fiction enough of our folklore is very much nature based and I, I always try to bring that in as well. Um, that's why I brought in the, the Life of Friday because it's it's part of our language. Um, but if we can connect it to an animal like a, a bumblebee, it gives it an extra dimension. Um, so I do think that adults as well as children get a good response to it. Indeed, um, I've had, because they make lovely bedtime stories, I have a lot of parents, in particular grandparents, who read the stories um, to their grandkids. Um, very often I get a, a, a bigger response from the grandparents as, as I do from the kids. And that's always um, very welcome. Because, like I say, the stories should be for everyone. Um, and, and somebody is, is asking here, Shane, can you tell us where the, the books can be bought generally? Yes, absolutely. Um, well, locally in, in the Burren, um, we had them in the shops in Benor, Bedimon, and bookshops in Innes, Diamond, and Innes. And they're also available online through our website, shanecaseybooks.ie, um, and as well as on, on the website. And this is particularly important at, at the moment because um, I know a lot of people are homeschooling um, with the, the kids being at home. We actually have produced um, a little teacher's handbook of support materials. Um, I, I've, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of friends who are teachers and they've given me a lot of feedback on how they use the books in classroom situations and I pulled all their advice together into a little uh, package which is available on the, on the website and right now it would be an ideal resource for parents who want to uh, build on the stories and expand because like the, the story of Thomas Riley you can uh, start to teach kids about pollination and um, the the reference to the dandelion obviously is very important because like I said they are one of the first nectar rich flowers and it's a new way of looking at a, a flower that's very often regarded as a weed and get rid of it but actually dandelions and, and those species are are very important. Jane there's lots of uh, really nice messages for you saying that people have really enjoyed your story and before you know you get into the next story I think I'll take the last question before you maybe read us another story. Phil Not says our four-year-old loved the story and was identifying some of the flowers. Many thanks from the Isle of Skye. So um, Thank you. there you go. There's, so um, you there's to... one. There's one more. There's, there's one more Shane that I'd love to ask you. Um, Anna, aged eight, asks, "How long did it take you to write this book?" That is a very good question. Um, some of the stories I can write very quickly. They only take a couple of days. Um, other stories can take a, a bit longer. Uh, Bombus Riley actually took me quite a long time. Um, part of the reason for that is that when I started writing it, I was looking at the story from the perspective of Queen Hannah rather than Thomas Riley, 
and it, it was the wrong approach. So I had to stop and rewrite it. And it took me a couple of goes. And the thing about um, writing is, is it, it takes a lot of patience and time. And if you don't get it right the first time, you get it right the second time or the third time or the fourth time, and you just keep uh, trying at it. Uh, writing is a skill that you just have to practice over and over again. Um, so Bombus Riley took me the, the longest. Uh, there's other stories in, in the same book. There's one about the two little hedgehogs, took me a few days. And another one about um, a young swift called Sinan who's scared of flying. And that took about a, a week or two. Uh, but Bombus took me a little bit longer just to get that, get that right. Do you want to start into your next story, Shane? Yes, certainly yeah. will. Thank you. And thank you for those questions. They're, they're fantastic. Chasing Dragons There are all kinds of creatures that only exist in fairy tales. There are unicorns, dragons, mermaids, and many more. But what if someone told you they had seen one? Would you believe them? Larry wasn't the kind of ladybird that believed in fairy tales. But what if he was wrong? Larry lived in a little neighbourhood at the edge of a hay meadow. Like all ladybirds, he spent most of his days searching for food, and there was always plenty of green fly hiding among the oxide daisies to satisfy a hungry young ladybird. It was a busy neighbourhood, and Larry had lots of neighbours. There were grasshoppers, caterpillars, and even a few spiders. One day, Larry overheard a strange conversation between a grasshopper and a caterpillar. Aye, it was a dragon all right, whispered the grasshopper. It was down by the willow tree that overhangs the lake. What did it look like, asked the caterpillar. It was huge, replied the grasshopper, with a body of fire and four powerful wings. My goodness, exclaimed the caterpillar. What a sight it must have been. Now, grasshoppers are known to exaggerate, but what if it were true? What if there really was a dragon down by the lake? It wasn't very far from Larry's neighbourhood. Across the field, over the hedge, and you'll see the lake in the distance. Larry had to find out for himself, and so off he set. Larry hadn't gone very far when he heard a curious buzzing sound. Up ahead, Larry could see a plump little bumblebee dancing from flower to flower. As he got closer, Larry called out to her. Oh, hello there, said the bumblebee, speaking at a mile a minute. My name is Buttons and I love to dance. I dance with the daisies and I dance with the buttercups. I could dance from dawn until dusk. I just love to dance. Would you like to dance? Now, as it happens, Larry was a very fine dancer and he happily accepted Buttons' invitation. Together, they danced a jig, a chive and a waltz as the flowers of the meadow swayed to the song of the summer breeze. When the dance was over, Larry told Buttons all about the dragon. Well, you better be on your way, replied Buttons. Just remember, the real treasure is not always what you find, but the adventure you have along the way. Larry didn't really understand what Buttons was trying to tell him. So he just shrugged his shoulders and set off again, across the meadow and towards the hedge. Suddenly, a huge shadow appeared overhead, but Larry wasn't scared. You see, unlike other insects, ladybirds aren't very nice to eat. That's why they wear black spots on bright red shells, to remind any potential predators that they taste terrible. Larry looked up to see what was casting the shadow and saw a very handsome individual. It was a peacock butterfly. Oh, what beautiful wings you have, exclaimed Larry. I love the eyes that you painted on them. Thank you, replied the butterfly. They help to fool the predators into thinking I am bigger than I really am. What a clever idea, thought Larry. Where are you off to on this lovely day, inquired the butterfly. Larry told him all about the dragon. Well, I hope you find it, he said. Just remember, the real treasure is not always what you find but the adventure you have along the way. That's funny, thought Larry. 
That's what Buttons had told him too. But Larry still didn't understand what they were trying to tell him. Larry set off again in the direction of the lake. As he got closer, Larry noticed something strange at the base of a purple-headed thistle. It looked like a rock, but it was moving. Moving very, very slowly. Suddenly, someone poked her head out from underneath. Who are you? exclaimed Larry. I'm Sam, came the answer. Do you like riddles by any chance? inquired Sam. Oh yes, replied Larry. I love riddles. What creature can travel the world without ever leaving home? asked Sam. Uh, um, I don't know, shrugged Larry. Why, it's a snail, laughed Sam. Oh, that's very clever, replied Larry. Now I have a riddle for you. What kind of bird has wings but no feathers? Uh, um, I don't know, answered Sam. A ladybird, of course, exclaimed Larry with a smile. Larry and Sam continued asking riddles until there were no riddles left to ask. Then Larry told Sam all about the dragon. Just remember, said Sam, the real treasure is not always what you find, but the adventure you have along the way. This was the third time that Larry had heard these words, but he still didn't understand what they meant. Larry set off once more, and finally he reached the willow tree that overhung the lake. He looked all around him in search of the dragon. He looked left and right, then up and down, and then he saw it. A huge creature with a body of fire and four powerful wings. It was a dragon, all right, but not the kind that only exists in fairy tales. It was a common darter dragonfly, and unlike the fairy tale creatures, they really do exist. It was in that moment that Larry finally understood what everyone had been trying to tell him. Larry hadn't found the fire breathing creature he had been looking for, but he did have an incredible adventure along the way. The end. Thank you. That was beautiful, Shane. Thank you. I was going to ask you, Shane, you, you, your books say they're dyslexia friendly. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I can. Um, maybe the easiest way, if I can try share screen once more. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a number of features. Now, can you see that page? Uh, yeah. Yeah, perfect. There's yeah. a number of features. The, the first and most important is the color scheme. Uh, when you have black text on a white background, it can be very hard on your eyes. So we went for the soft cream color with dark blue text. Uh, it's also a special type of font. It's called Open Dyslexia. Um, so you'll notice the way it's slightly thicker on the bottom. That helps um, ground it on the page for some. Dyslexia uh, affects people differently. And for some people, the text will actually move on the page or fall off it. Uh, whereas this font helps to actually ground it and keep it in place. And also the, the individual letters are quite well spaced out and oddly shaped, so there's no chance of mixing them up. Some fonts, the letters I, J and L, look very similar to just like strokes on the page. Um, you also find things like having a double space after a full stop. When I was being taught to how to type, I was told one space after a comma, two spaces after a full stop. But actually the double space creates white rivers on the page or lightning on the page. Um, and the final thing then is you find justifying the text. So, you know, sometimes you have a block of text, it's, it's level on both sides, but that can be quite daunting if you have dyslexia, whereas a jagged end and edge is easier to see where the sentence ends. Um, I, I learned most of these features uh, from a school in Ennis. I, I was scared giving a, a talk on biodiversity and uh, the kids down there, they produced their own book on their experiences of, of living with dyslexia. And they're they were very rightly proud of the, the book that they had produced. Um, and I went home thinking, I'm about to publish a children's book. Um, I'd love to publish a book for those kids because um, they, they would really enjoy it and, and uh, appreciate it. How can I go about doing it? So my, my wife and I, my wife is a little bit dyslexic, so she can see all these features. Um, we did our research and we um, published the book in a dyslexic format. And it's important to, to note that uh, it's only the format and design that's dyslexia friendly. The stories for themselves are for everyone. If you if you don't have dyslexia, you might notice that much of a difference, just a little bit brighter maybe. 
But if you if you do have the sexy and winning on the level of the sex you have, it can make a huge difference. Um, and uh, the feedback we've had so far from, I suppose, the kids themselves, most importantly, but also the parents and teachers of those kids has been just extraordinary. We have a few comments here, um, particularly uh, Maureen, who's a teacher and says, thank you for the consideration for uh, dyslexia. Um, final question I have for you, uh, young Shane Casey, was he inspired by anyone in particular growing up in the burn or was there anyone who, who instilled such a love of nature for you? Because clearly it's a, a life's mission you have here. Um, y yes, I suppose it can, can only really be um, one answer to that, and that's my my parents, obviously, because um, uh, my 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 father's family have uh, farmed Blackhead for for generations, and my mother's family are from Bahar, which is on the other side of the the barn. And I suppose growing up, um, it just instilled such a a recognition of how special of a place Blackhead actually is. Um, in in all of us, um, that it's I, I I could say I I I was inspired by by the authors that I, I read. I, I used to love Willow Price um, reading books and um, Roald Dahl and Ian Blyton all those. I loved listening to David Attenborough and Edge documentaries. Um, but I suppose in terms of passion for Blackhead and the Burn in particular, yeah, that that can only go to my own family and my own parents. Sorry, I know Bronya said that was the last question, Shane, but I couldn't uh, let you go without maybe telling our viewers that um, you are currently in the process of producing a book, especially for the Burren, you know, especially on the theme of the Burren Winterish, and we are hoping um, that we'll be able to print it and have it available for people to buy. We are in the, at the moment looking for funds to, to produce it. So if anyone is interested or have, has suggestions on this, um, please email us at info at But I'll maybe say a few lines about this book, uh, this wonderful book that's in the making. Uh, yes, absolutely. It's a story that, um, a story that I've been trying to write for a, a very long time, um, a, a way of explaining the link between farming and the, the flowers of the burn. We probably all know the, the, that story the, from a scientific point of view. But I've been trying to tell it in a, a children's story format and um, like I say I've been trying to, to write it for a long time and I've kind of, I got it now and it's a, a chance encounter between a young short horn calf on Blackhead called Sarah and a cuckoo called Colin and um, without giving too much away Colin uh, comes for the, the, the barn floor but Sarah's never seen it because uh, during the summertime cattle are never on the, the barn so she doesn't know whether to believe them or not um, but it's a story that it, like I say it's based on, on Black Hill and it's a, a, my own personal experience of, of the barn but it's mm -hmm. it's a book that uh, like I say we're hoping to publish in the autumn and um, we'll be donating it to the Barn Bio Trust. I've seen firsthand the incredible work that the Trust does in terms of education particularly to their eco bio program that, that visits all schools here in the, in the burn. Um, but they do all this on a shoestring budget and I'm hoping that by donating the, the book and I've been very privileged that uh, Gordon Darcy, an incredible artist, has, has joined me in, in this, um, that we can donate it to the, uh, uh, the entire book to the Farm Your Trust for fundraising going forward so that they can continue that fantastic work. Thank you very much, Shane. That's very generous of you. And we are still looking for funds to print it and uh, distribute it. So if uh, anyone has any ideas around this, because, you know, um, Shane Casey and Gordon Darcy have very generously given their time and expertise in, in making this book. And now we're looking to see how we can finish it and have it available for people. So we are looking for your suggestions. Uh, please email them at info at